thank everyone who is in the waiting room. Good morning. This is a hearing before the licensing board for the city of Boston. Today is Tuesday, May 5th, 2020. Good morning. My name is Kathleen Joyce. I'm chair of the licensing board. This morning, I'm joined by Commissioner Liam Curran and Commissioner Kiana Saxon. And I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us today. And just some brief procedural uh, issues. This will be conducted, this is an emergency hearing of the board. This will be conducted um, pursuant to the governor's executive order amending the open meeting laws. This is being recorded and will be, will be posted within 24 hours to the city's website. The voting meeting will be held on Thursday at 10 a.m. That is also recorded and will be posted to the city's website. And to be clear, today we are only reviewing the alleged violations at hand. We are not specifically looking into whether there has been a violation of Governor Baker's COVID-19 related order uh, regarding short-term rent rentals or lodging houses. I will, the, I will read the notice into the record at which point I will ask anyone who wishes to testify to raise your right hand and I will swear you in all at once after which the police will read the various police reports into the record. And then we will have uh, questions from the board as well as testimony from the licensee and their legal counsel. Just to be clear, uh, is uh, representatives from the licensee, are you present? Uh, yes, this is Josh Burr, general counsel for the licensee. Okay. I don't see my counsel. Is Dennis Kofi on? Is a tree quilty currently on? Let's see. Do you want to call him and see if he's having trouble joining the meeting? Yes. Yeah, let me do that. Just yeah, take your time. On there and comparing it to phone. So there are two phone numbers. Here's one that I believe. Yeah. Attorney Quilty, is that you? Hello. Hello, I am here. Okay, so, I will now read this uh, hearing notice into the record and then I will swear all parties in and ask you to state your names. Calling 12 Hemingway Manager LLC, doing business as Boston Fenway Inn, located at 12 Hemingway Street. This is a hearing before the board to determine whether the following alleged incidents warrant disciplinary, warrant disciplinary action by the board, including but not limited to the suspension or revocation of the license. Date, April 4th, 2020, incident report responding to a call for a fight. Date, April 4th, 2020, incident report responding to a call to investigate a person. Date, April 12th, 2020, Incident report responding to a call to assist with removal. License premise inspection issued for failure to follow non-essential business order. Date April 12th, 2020. Incident report calling to responding to a call to investigate a person. Date April 15th, 2020. Incident report responding to a call for a noise disturbance. Date April 23rd, 2020. Incident report responding to a call for assault and battery with a deadly weapon. License premise inspection notice issued April 29th, 2020, patron on patron assault by means of a dangerous weapon and failure to notify police. Date April 29th, 2020, incident report, license premise inspection. License premise inspection notice issued for patron drinking alcohol on public sidewalk in front of license premise. Any individuals who wish to testify, please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Please state your names for the record, starting with Sergeant Gallagher. You're in my top uh, left corner. Sergeant Detective William Gallagher, Boston Police, currently assigned to the license premise unit. Detective Hernandez? Detective Eddie Hernandez, Boston Police, currently assigned to license premise unit. Captain Sweeney? Captain Stephen Sweeney, currently assigned to District 4 in the South End. And who is present for the licensee? Joshua Bird, General Counsel for the licensee. 
Uh, Jules Sebastian, general manager. And Dennis Quilty, I've, I had no service and I'm, I'm here somehow. Under Peggy Quilty. No, <laughs> under Peggy Quilty. Had a, had a switch, switch platforms here. I'm sorry, I was, I was delayed. I couldn't get on the, uh, I couldn't get on through my laptop, so. No problem. Um, thank you all. And is it, I mean, certainly, if, may I just for a moment as a, a make a, a bit of an opening the we've had the we have all the reports thanks to um, attorney uh, Delaney Hawkins um, we'd certainly be happy to waive the reading of the detailed police reports and would offer at the very outset of the hearing to voluntarily shut down um, in an effort to you know bring about changes necessary to properly run the facility uh, staffing, et cetera, and do a variety of things in order to uh, um, get back into a situation where we're not causing any issues for the city. Um, you know, there are some, some difficulties they've had, obviously, and I would like to work those out. would like to be cooperative with the authorities, with the police department, with the licensing board. So as just at the very beginning, we offer that as a um, an olive branch, if you will, to uh, to the board and the police department. I think, um, Attorney Quilty, I think we could, the board could take that under advisement um, and mm -hmm. consider that at its voting hearing. But while this has been posted, I believe we do have to go forward with the reading of the reports. All right. Okay, Sergeant Gallagher, did you yes, want to begin? Like, yes, there are seven reports and I'll alternate with Detective Hernandez. The first one is uh, written by Officer Adam DePerry. It's about 7.50 a.m. on Saturday, 4-4-2020. Officers DePerry in the Delta 499 in Zonic in the Delta 421 responded to a radio call for a fight at 12 Hemingway Street, the Boston Fenway Inn. Operations notified officers that a third party in caller and an employee at the above address heard individuals fighting on the fourth floor. On arrival, officers located both parties involved in the fight who were identified as Dylan Sampagnano, date of birth 32996, and Eduardo Pereira, Date of birth 1270, 12, 73 Mr. Sampanaro stated that both he and Mr. Pereira were guests at the hostel, and they, along with three other males, were hanging around last night in Mr. Sampanaro's room. Mr. Sampanaro stated that Mr. Pereira slept over in the room. Mr. Sampanaro stated that this morning, after he had a cigarette, he returned to his room, and at that time, Mr. Pereira, who was sleeping on the floor, got up and hugged Mr. Sampanaro. Mr. Sampanaro stated to Mr. Pereira that he wasn't gay and that he only wanted to be friends. Mr. Pereira then backed away and eventually left the room after a verbal argument. Mr. Pereira denied hugging Mr. Sampanaro. Mr. Pereira was escorted out of the hostel. All parties were run from warrants and Sergeant Cullen, the Delta 907 also responded. Those are the facts of that first report. Thank you. You're welcome. May, may, I just, may I inquire of uh, Sergeant Detective Gallagher? Do you want to read the reports in first or, uh, how, okay. or take them one at a time? I think we're just going to read them in first. Okay. And take them all as one. Okay. Yep. Uh, Detective Hernandez, are you going to read the next one? Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, I'm okay. reading a police report that was authored by uh, Officer Kelly Ryan. Um, about 6, 17 p.m. on Wednesday, 4, 18, mm -hmm. 2020, Officer Ryan and the Delta 411 responded to a radio call uh, for investigate persons at 12 Hemingway Street, apartment 416, Boston. Officer Ryan was assisted by a Kilo 904, Sergeant McMahon. Upon arrival, officers were approached by the reporting caller, Benjamin Coffey, date of birth of 72180, who stated that on 4-7-20 at approximately 7 p.m., a friend of 
is later identified as Ricky Elliott, date of birth of 53075, and an unknown female had visited him at the above address. Mr. Coffey informed officers mm -hmm. that the unknown female that was with Ricky Elliott appeared to be only 15 to 16 years old. Mr. Coffey stated that when Ricky Elliott and the unknown female had shown up to the above address, Ricky Ellis had proceeded to lay down on the ground of the apartment and inform Mr. Coffey that they were go going to film a porno movie with the unknown female. Mr. Coffey informed Officer Ryan that the film was never actually produced nor did any sexual act occur. Mr. Coffey stated that he became uncomfortable with Ricky Elliott's request and Ricky Elliott stated that he was going to leave because he didn't want to get him, Mr. Coffey, in trouble. The Kilo 904 Sergeant McMahon contacted the Boston Police Crimes Against Children's Unit. Officers advised Mr. Coffey to contact the police if Ricky Elliott re returns to the above address with the unknown mm -hmm. female or if another incident occurs. Those are essentially the facts of that police report. Okay. Thank you. Okay, the uh, next police report is on Sunday, April 12, 2020. Sergeant Hogarth, the Delta 908, responded to the Boston Fenway Inn located at 12 Hemingway Street to assist other D4 units with their removal. Also on scene was the Delta 103, Officers Walton and Tobin, and the Delta 631, Officer Villalex, and the Delta 499, Officer McCarthy. This was the second call police received to this location that morning regarding the guests that refused to leave. Last report on that incident report is 6563. When Sergeant Hauga arrived, the unruly guest was actively removing her belongings into a waiting vehicle. The inn's assistant manager, Nico Lamas, was outside observing the process. Sergeant Hogart then asked to speak with Mr. Lamas inside the establishment. Sergeant Hogart reminded Mr. Lamas that he had introduced himself back on April 6, 2020. We stopped by to see if the Boston Family Inn was abiding by the recently issued non-essential business emergency order, which prevents lodging housing from providing lodging for non-essential COVID-19 reasons. On April 4th, 2020, Sergeant Cullen responded to 12 Hemingway Street for an investigated person called, the last four on that, uh, 4942. We spoke with the front desk manager, Jeremy Della, he provided her with two copies of the order, which were issued by both the Commonwealth and the City of Boston. When Sergeant Hogart met Ms. Lamas on April 6th, he also provided him with copies of the order, and he was assured that the Boston Family Inn was abiding by the guidelines. On April 12th, 2020, Sergeant Hogart again asked Ms. Lamas if the inn was abiding by the non-essential business emergency order, Mr. Lamas stated they were, and Sergeant Hogart asked to see documentation that the inn was collecting on new renters to prove that they met the conditions detailed in the order. <clears throat> the Lamas provided Sergeant Hogart with a folder, informed him that these people who recently rented the rooms. At random, Sergeant Hogart pulled out a piece of paper which showed a photocopy of the individual's Maryland driver's license along with handwritten numbers 4-19-2020 to 4-10-2020. Sergeant Hogart asked Mr. Lamas if the handwritten, handwriting on the paper meant that that individual pictured in the licensed renting room on April 9th, 2020 and checked out on April 10th, 2020. Mr. Lamas stated that's exactly what that means. Sergeant Hogart then asked Mr. Lamas if the inn had any other proof or documentation such as copies of hospital ID, law enforcement ID, to prove that the renters met the conditions of the order. Mr. Lamas stated that they did not and had not been collecting that information. Sergeant Hogarth then issued Mr. Lamas a license premise violation number 025411 for failure to follow the non-essential business order that was issued by the Commonwealth and the City of Boston on 4-1-2020. It should be noted that throughout the process, Mr. Lamas was cooperative with Sergeant Hogart and the other officers that were on scene. Those are some of the facts that report. All right, I'll, I'll be reading the next police report. 
This was uh, authored by um, Officer Mark Tobin. At about 7.51 a.m. on Sunday, 4-12-20, Officers Tobin and Walton in the Delta 103 Delta responded to investigate persons mm -hmm. at 12 Hemingway, apartment 411 in the Fenway neighborhood. Upon arrival, officers spoke with security and management for the Hemingway Inn located at the above address. They stated that they had a guest whom they identified as Mary Pollard causing issues and wanted her removed. She had been staying at the hostel for approximately one month and today is the last day of her reservation. Check out at 11 a.m. Officers then spoke with a reporting party caller, Mary Pollard. Pollard stated on three separate occasions she had found other guests clothing in her laundry while it was drying. Officers asked Pollard about the statements made in, the, made in regards to a gun to which she admittedly stated she had made earlier, but that she did not actually have one. She did not have a gun on her person nor in her room at, at that time. I spoke with all parties involved and agreed that Pollard would be able to uh, finish drying her laundry, gather her belongings, and then leave the hostel by 11 a.m. That is essentially all the facts of this report. Thank you. Okay, the uh, next report starts at about 8 a.m. on Wednesday, 4-15-2020. Officer McGregor and Officer Lucas responded to a radio call for noise disturbance at 12 Hemingway Street. Upon arrival, officers spoke to the manager, Jules Sebastian, of the found hotels located at the above address. Mr. Sebastian stated that he came in this morning around 7 a.m. and heard the victim, later identified as Paul King, dated birth 522-62, yelling in the bathroom on the main floor. Mr. Sebastian stated he thought the victim was talking to someone, but the victim came out of the bathroom alone. Mr. Sebastian stated the victim was not a resident and must have piggybacked in behind someone at some point between last night and early this morning. Mr. Sebastian stated the victim continued to yell things that did not make any sense, and he kept going behind his counter in the front lobby, so he called the police. When officers arrived, the victim continued to yell very loudly and mumble by not making much sense. Officers were concerned about the victim's mental well-being and called Boston EMS. Boston EMS A22 was transported to the victim, Beth Israel Hospital for further evaluation. Those are the facts of that report. <clears throat> Okay, I'm reading from another police report authored by Dennis Pagero. Um, at about 3.04 p.m. on Wednesday, 4.23.20, Officer Pagero and Officer De Silva of the Delta 105 Delta responded to a radio call for an assault and battery slash deadly weapon report at 12 Hemingway Street, Boston, Mass., Boston Fenway Inn Hotel. Upon arrival, officers were met by the victim, Eli Sanders, who stated another guest, suspect Kenny McDadden came into his room, number 210, and threatened, threatened him with a knife this morning. The victim stated that about 2 a.m., the suspect came into his room and demanded, with a knife, all of the victim's money and drugs. The victim stated, stated he informed the suspect he did not have any money or drugs and just a little bit of weed. The suspect then fled from the room. After the suspect fled, the victim went down the stairs and reported what happened to the front desk. The victim informed officers that he did not call the police last night because he was scared of the police. The victim also stated that the suspect had been threatening him all day via text messages and admitted to slashing Korea his bike tires. The victim described the suspect to be a skinny white male, 200 pounds, about 6'3 tall and 40 to 50 years old. The suspect described to be wearing a black jacket with a white t-shirt underneath and gray sweatpants. The victim said the su suspect was staying in room 410. Officers um, were knocked, knocked on room 410 and got no response. Officers spoke with general manager, Jules Sebastian, about this incident, and he stated the suspect left a signed document stating the victim tried to, s to sell him drugs last night. The victim stated he was released from prison two to three weeks ago, and he had been staying at the Fenway Inn Hotel ever since. 
This led officers to believe that the hotel was violating the new mandated regulations that were set by the state in regards to COVID-19. Officers informed the general manager, Jules Sebastian, this information was going to be documented. Lieutenant Burns and Sergeant Cullen were notified. <clears throat> and I'm reading from a supplemental report um, that was authored by Michael Nucci about four, on Wednesday, 429.20, Detective Nucci to Telta 841, after conducting a follow-up investigation into this matter, responded to 12 Hemingway Street and issued license premise violation number 025429. On this date, Detective Nucci spoke with the victim of this incident, Eli Sanders, who stated that he communicated the threat of violence to the staff of this establishment at approximately 8.30 a.m. on 423. However, he did not speak to the police until he called 911 at approximately not at 3 p.m. Additionally, Detective Nucci spoke with the front desk manager of the premise, Jules Sebastian, who confirmed that he was made aware of the incident uh, at approximately 8.30 a.m. Sebastian stated that he also attempted to speak with the alleged suspect of the incident who was initially <laughs> unable to make was initially able to make contact. Sebastian also said that he did eventually make contact with the alleged suspect who denied the allegations and made further allegations that drugs were being sold in the victim's apartment. Sebastian confirmed that neither he nor any staff members notified the police at any time. Uh, violation notice was issued at approximately uh, <coughs> 8 a.m. and signed by the front desk manager, Jules Sebastian, for patron on patron assault by means of a dangerous weapon and failure to notify mm -hmm. police. Those were essentially facts. Okay, here's the last report here. This is written by myself. Um, on 4 29, <laughs> 2020, at about 9 40 p.m., Sergeant Detective William Gallagher. Detective Andy Hernandez assigned the licensed premise unit were monitoring the Boston Fenway Inn at 12 Hemingway Street. This address, uh, as is the first of this year, has generated about 30 911 calls for police. Detectives had just left the premise after <coughs> speaking to the front desk clerk, Nico Lamas, about residents drinking alcohol in front of the inn and were sitting in their car when their attention was drawn to a male standing in front of the inn. Detectives observed this male to open and drink a nip bottle of alcohol. The male then discarded the empty bottle onto the sidewalk. Detectives approached the male, who was later identified as Darrell Talbert, date of birth 5 12 82 of Boston. Detectives identified themselves and inquired if Mr. Talbot was a registered guest at the Fenway Inn. Mr. Talbert stated yes, and detectives escorted him back into the lobby. Inside the premise, detectives showed Mr. Talbot to the desk clerk and informed him of their observations. As a result, what detectives had observed, Sergeant Detective Gallagher issued a license <coughs> premise inspection notice number 048094 to the Boston Fenway Inn for patron drinking alcohol on public way in front of premise. Mr. Lico Lamas signed for and accepted the notice. Detectives took down Mr. Gerald Talbot's information had him pick up his trash and gave him a verbal warming on public drinking. Mr. Talbot then returned to his room. Those are uh, all the reports. Hmm. Um, Madam Chair, may I inquire? Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Thank you for uh, reading those in. Thank you, Detective. If, if I may, obviously it's uh, difficulty to get the uh, attendance of the officers on short notice, but with the exception of the very last of the reports, Detective Sergeant, those were reports of other officers that you- I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing Attorney Quilt. I'm sorry, I, I don't know what to do here. Um, am I just, uh, is it just weak? I can hear you. I can hear you. One second. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you. All right. I think the chairwoman's having trouble with their connection. Ah, uh, sorry about that. Um, One second. There we go. Any, any better? Yeah, we have video now, too. We yeah, but <laughs> Thank you. I think, it, I think it's my... Um, my computer, but I, I'm, I can hear you now. Okay, 
Thank you. I just wanted to verify that with the exception of the very last of the reports, the detectives were reading reports of other officers into the record. That's correct. And the last report was your own report that you gave on the, for the 29th uh, occurrence. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, I just, it's a little bit difficult going through obviously a number of these, um, but I just would like to verify that First of all, we're not, I, I think the attorney uh, suggested we're not being heard on any violations of the COVID-19 state and city regulations. That is that, correct. That's correct. So I, I just, in looking at the various reports, and again, thank you for to attorney Delaney Hawkins for getting those to us. Um, the April 4th, which is, I, I think is the first one that I have, uh, that was a call in by an employee that was called in by the manager of record. The um, police report, as best I have seen it, refers to a verbal argument that was literally called in by the management. Um, the, so, I mean, the, the, if there was something that was discovered, an issue, a problem that needed the police response, I mean, I would think that the manager did the right thing by calling it in. And it, I mean, it appears to be a verbal, arg verbal argument between people in the building. Um, Attorney I, Quilty, we're not trying to discourage the licensee from calling the police. We're trying to right. discourage the reasons why activity is right. going on at this place that requires the police attention during this time. I understand. I would just, I would just hope there's, there's, as, as in any violation handled by the board, there's always a difference when observances are made by employees, by managers of record, and those are called in. And, and in that respect, they're doing, I think, what's expected of them in the circumstances, as opposed to situations where they don't call in, they don't inform the police. So there's, there's a and again, I mean, I'm just trying to, there, there were just certain things in various reports I just think should be made clear on the record. And, and other than that, I would go back and rate that we're perfectly willing and desirous of, of shutting this down voluntarily to clean up the entire business. Um, I mean, there, there are some odd allegations in here. There's one where it indicates that there's some potential mental issues uh, one with some allegation of a porn film with, you know, nobody on premises when the police police arrive, no arrests. Um, there are others where, again, it's the manager making a call to get a troubled patron out. Um, I think there were two occasions where people were, were to leave and didn't, where they had to call the police. Um, I mean, look, understanding that, you know, the numbers of calls add up. We, you know, we understand that those are issues for the Boston Police Department. We'd like to be more fully cooperative going forward. And um, just suggesting that on a number of these instances, I think the management did the responsible thing, which is to call the police when there was an issue uh, and, and ask for help. Um, you know, the issue, the, the other things like the person drinking a nip outside the building. Um, I mean, the, obviously unfortunate, you know, the circumstances were that you know, that person was given a verbal warning and you know, I don't think there were any arrests made in actually any of these circumstances in any event. We want to get to a point where we're not causing issues for the Boston Police Department, not having calls to the premises. Uh, and, and we think that, you know, an opportunity to basically give a clean uh, sweep, if you will, of the entire operation top to bottom staffing security and the like will put us in a much better position with the board going forward and we certainly understand that you don't want uh, places with 30 phone calls you know to the police in the neighborhood okay thank you um i just have a few things the reason why we called this hearing was because it has been clear been made clear to us through captain sweeney and the police in that area that this has become a burden to them especially during the state of emergency. So whatever, and your staff has been cooperative with submitting a safety and operations plan, which we have reviewed. And on its face, um, it looks as if it um, goes a long way to address some of the issues that were described in the police reports. But I think there's even additional things that the licensee can do 
um, to make the place safer for the people staying there, but also for the people in the neighborhood and also for the police that have to respond to these calls. Um, when, if you are considering voluntary, voluntarily shutting down, when would the last uh, date be of your current guests staying there? Josh or Nicholas, can either of you guys? Yeah. So I think, you know, we, maybe we wanted to work with um, you on what, what your expectation or what might work best. Um, I don't know how much of our, um, what I passed on to attorney Quilty uh, made its way to you, but we do have a reasonable expectation that the, we have about 13 folks. How many folks in the, are in the building right now, Jules or Nico? Uh, we have, uh, thir I believe 13. That's so correct. We have 13 folks there. Um, look, we, you know, you never really know, but we have a reasonable expectation that, that if we were to um, close our doors, um, a material number of those folks would be homeless or not have anywhere to go. Um, I, I think that's a part of the driver here. We're a low cost facility, um, um, just by the nature of our setup. And so it, it attracts a certain um, type of person. Not all, you know, that those people are, are have many problems, but, but it, it attracts a certain type of person, especially during these times when there are more people who have fewer options. Um, and, and so I, I say that to say, you know, your question was, was when can we close down? I mean, look, we could close down tomorrow, um, um, but I don't, you know, but those people, but I don't know if you suggested earlier that, that you may have some options for rehousing people, some shelter options. We provided that to people we've, we've removed previously, but um, I think the ideal thing is to give folks a couple of days notice. Um, if we were to say today that we were, that we should close down temporarily, then we could probably close down we, on Thursday. We wouldn't want to. Um, we wouldn't want you to voluntarily close down and have people end up homeless. So I guess right. of your current reservations of these 13 people, when is the last reservation set to expire? Do you know? Uh, yeah, they, yeah, they let, can... yeah, let me just review. I'm looking at the last um, checkout would be on May 15. Okay. So just a couple of other questions, things that stood out to me in reading the police reports. I've never been to the licensed premise, so I just need some clarification of um, the laundry room. Right now, is it open to everyone at any time or is it um, segmented by guest or certain times of the day? It is open 24 hours, um, so guests can um, utilize as needed. Okay. Those are things you might want to consider. Um, eliminating the places where people can gather. Um, cafeterias, uh, laundry rooms. Um, and how are guests allowed to bring visitors in? If this is supposed to be, are guests allowed? I mean, how are we, we how are you doing that in, in, and um, abiding by the rules we have a standard policy that we do not allow guests in all the rooms because of safety and security. And this is something that it's been done as a standard policy before the pandemic occurred. So in the case that we found a guest violating to our standard policy, we just ask them to check out and uh, no accommodation will be further uh, provided. So if someone, is staying at your um, staying here and they have invited a guest does the guest have to go by the front desk and sign in yes they have to check with the with our guides or the front desk and they have to wait in the lobby we have a lounge um, next to our uh, lobby area where they can wait well I would think you wouldn't want to be doing that during this uh, state of emergency allowing any no, guests to come in understand i'm not talking about uh the current okay. situation i'm talking in general but okay. with, the, with the current situation that we're in we do not allow any guests at all as an example yesterday a guest um wanted to have a visitor come in and i politely asked um the visitor that uh we're close uh the lobby is close common areas are close so if we can wait outside okay and in some of these police reports, it appears that guests were allowed not only inside the license permits, but into guests' rooms. I mean, into paying guests' rooms. How did that happen? 
that's beyond our knowledge. Again, you know, we advise the guests. It's a standard policy that we do not allow uh, visitors and okay. only registered guests are allowed to stay in the room, either private or shared accommodation. So, and that's another question. You have how many rooms at this location? Total, total unit, uh, 60 rooms. And with 13 guests, are they all in their own room? No. Um, at the moment, uh, we changed our policy due to the pandemic. So we're providing one guest, one person per room, with the exception of if the guests um, know each other. As an example, we have a guest who's staying uh, a, a mother and daughter. Um, okay. A couple of friends was here, so yeah. Okay, and as far as security, you have someone at the front desk. Do you have security Correct. cameras? Correct, twenty-four hours, uh, seven days a week. And we do have an hourly log that we fill in for and write up uh, any pertinent notes during the shift, so uh, we know what's going on outside uh, the premise. Okay, and as far as loitering and drinking. In front of the premise, you do have a responsibility to eliminate that. We do. We actually posted uh, a no loitering private property uh, in front of our property, and uh, I think I believe on the side uh, area as well. Okay, but in addition to the signs, do you have um, a policy where someone goes out and checks on that? Yeah. So we do have uh, we uh, we have a curfew for guests uh, from 1 a.m. to 7 a.m. Um, they can go outside after those times if they're smoking because they're sort of smoking inside the property and we do allow that. But other than that, um, all the guests have been advised uh, not to congregate and there is a strict curfew between 1 a.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, Commissioner Curran or Commissioner Saxon, do you have any questions? Yes, I do. Um, just how do you distinguish a guest from a visitor? Do you just recognize their face or not recognize their face, or is there some sort of ID they need to present? Or a, a, a That's a good question. Um, we normally, so our entrance door is always locked at all times. Uh, if someone walks in, we ask to uh, show their identification. But normally at this time, we do not have guests or we do not have any visitors that comes in. And if they do come in, then we inform them if they're a guest or visitor. And normally they would just say, you know, like yesterday, someone just walked in and say, I'm here to visit so-and-so. And that's when we approach them and tell them that, you know, uh, they can wait outside because um, for safety reasons, uh, all the common areas are closed and we do not accept uh, accommodate or we do not allow guests or visitors inside the guest rooms. But I, I take your question or I understand your question. It, it raises a good point. I, I think, you know, understanding that what we're doing here is working on ways to, to sort of increase the security of the building. It, it, um, I think we should implement a policy or a program where we have some sort of tag or identification that folks can show so that we can easily, even as guides switch, some guys may not have recognized other, uh, you know, certain visitors. Um, these, these, our guests can show tags that identify them as guests and not visitors or people off the street. So I'm going to make a note and we're going to implement that at this property and probably others as well. Sounds good. Commissioner Carmen? Captain, Captain Sweeney, would you like to add something? Yeah, and I, my reception keeps going out if I lost anyone a minute ago. Sorry about that. Um, I, I just want to say, you know, with some of the reports, the, the clerks have been cooperative. I've, I've talked to Jules, you know, a couple of weeks ago, but it's just the overall call volume. Like you just mentioned some of the, uh, you know, extra guests reading these reports, you know, the first report that was written, someone sleeping on the floor of someone's room, it wasn't his room. So I, I think there's many things that can be tidied up there. You know, they've been receptive, getting back to you with their security plan. It's just the overall call volume, you know, like Sergeant Gallagher said since the beginning of the year, you know, over 30, we're upwards of 38 with 18 of them removals. And this isn't to dissuade anyone from calling because we appreciate the call coming from there, but there has to be changes made 
So we're not getting the calls there. I think they see that and that's all how this has come about. These things are gonna pop up at obviously licensed premises. It's the outside, the alleys is, you know, several community groups around there that have concerns about people hanging in the alleyway and then right out into the front of the building. So, you know, I think if we work on a plan together, you know, and I, mm -hmm. I think it'll get better. Mm -hmm. you know. Thank you. Great idea. And I think some increased increased signage um, throughout the building would be helpful. I understand some of this stuff probably needs to be reinforced with the guests at, at different levels or, you know, not just at the front desk, maybe in the hallways by the elevators or however they reach their rooms and reinforce it um, over and over um, that they're in violation of your your own rules if, you know, they're staying in someone else's room or if they're... Mm -hmm. um, you know, any illegal activities going on, um, clearer um, signage would also probably be helpful. Additional signage. And how is each guest room door secured? It is secured by um, uh, the guests normally access uh, by a key card. So as an example, if we have a private double, then there's a maximum of two key cards that we can give access to the guests. If we have um, a shared accommodation uh, with a maximum of four guests, uh, only four guests are able to access, we label them by uh, alphabets, alphabetical letters, yeah. Okay. Is there anyone else who has joined us today that um, would like to add any of the people from the licensed premise? Uh, yes, Kathleen. Uh, myself and Detective Nanas, when we were there last time, there was only one clerk on that night. I know there aren't a lot of guests there, but I think that would make it kind of hard for someone to do rounds of the premise and watch the front desk at the same time. I, I know it's a, it's a burden to hire people, but, uh, he looked a little short-handed, and I don't think he could cover all that he had to do. Also, I think there were a couple of blind spots in the cameras that uh, that they we talked about in front of the premise in that alley. I think the alley's covered, but there's there's some camera issues there as well that might need to be addressed. Sergeant Gallagher, when were you there last? Uh, the 30th, I think, last weekend, last last Thursday, okay. Friday. The very last report okay. was ours, and that was day uh, 429. And there was only one guy, Nico was the only person on that night. Okay. Well, perhaps we could provide the board with, given some of the concerns raised by the chair, chairwoman and the police, uh, that perhaps we could come up with some um, ideas, mechanisms that we could advocate to the board as to ways that we can address some of these issues. I, mean, I don't think you know the camera could be done immediately, but it could certainly be <clears throat> reviewed and looked at with an eye towards you know further uh, ability to see around the property, further staffing um, and the like. And perhaps we could provide you know some kind of a follow up writing to the board, offering some of these things up to uh, hopefully get this in a better position. Um, that would be helpful. I, I do have one more question because again, we are try not trying to discourage the licensee from contacting the police if something's going on. And I understand you do have security cameras. How long do you retain the security footage in case that is helpful to Boston police if should something happen that um, a crime happen that they need to investigate? That's one last question I had. I believe within a month. Okay. About and that's why we that's why we want you to call Boston police because if a crime has occurred, your video footage helps them um, solve the crime. And if they're waiting until a victim contacts them, your video might have already been erased. Um, I don't have any more questions at this time. Commissioners, do you have any questions? Leslie, do you have any questions? Nope, the um, board will take this under advisement uh, for consideration at its Thursday voting hearing at 10 a.m. Uh, Attorney Quilty, if you do want to submit additional yeah. documentation for consideration, if you could do so prior to that date. 
Okay. Uh, Thank we, you all I, very much. I think we shouldn't take any actions about shutting down or anything until we, we hear from you. Correct. The, the board will make a determination as to what to do, and we have made the offer to, to shut down, and the board will take that up when it votes on Thursday. In the meantime, um, Joshua, we should try to get together a writing, you know, talking to some of the issues that came up today, the laundry room, the outside, the cameras, uh, you know, mm -hmm. security, key cards, et cetera, and provide that to the board so that they have it in time for their vote on Thursday. Understood. Yeah, just okay. something to perhaps something to supplement when you've already submitted to the board last week or the week before. Yeah, precisely. Okay. All right. Thank you all okay. for joining us today and for taking the time. Thank, thank you, you very thank much. You. Thank you very Thanks. much. Have a good day. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.